Welcome to today's lecture, um, the second lecture in the introduction to banking. And last week uh, we stopped right before the um, short introduction to the characteristics of the German banking system. Um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the three pillars and the different types of banks we have in the German banking system because I think um, especially uh, compared to the US and even UK and French uh, and Japanese banking system, the German banking system is quite peculiar in its structure and you will see this uh, in just a bit. Uh, for example, um, we have a universal banking system. Um, historically, uh, we've always had um, the universal banking system with banks offering both commercial and investment banking services. We've never had uh, a system in which um, investment banking and commercial banking were separated. Uh, this is quite different from the US. In the US, uh, we've seen all types of banking system. Um, nowadays we have again a slightly separated uh, banking system where, you know, where banks cannot operate all types of uh, services or at least they have to operate under more uh, with more capital uh, and under uh, tougher regulation but uh, later on we'll see how this developed over the decades and centuries in the US. In Germany we have a universal banking system. So banks are allowed to offer both commercial and uh, investment banking. Uh, but we have three pillars. Also, we call them this in German, drei Säulen. Uh, we have three pillars uh, of different types of banks in Germany. We have credit banks or private universal banks, Kreditbanken, private Geschäftsbanken. We have savings banks or savings and loan associations. Those are the uh, famous Sparkassen. Um, there are some minor differences between uh, some of the savings and loan associations, but it's uh, in general we have a um, Sparkasse that is owned by a municipality, by a county or by a city. And last but not least, we have cooperative banks or credit unions or mutual banks. By the way, if you, um, because some of you might also be interested in, oh, why is it gone now? Okay, now it's back again. Why has a beamer failed? Now it's back now. Okay. Um, if you have, uh, if you are at least a bit interested in insurance companies, uh, you might be interested in the fact that um, you also have mutual insurers. And with mutual insurers, it's the same idea as with credit unions or mutual banks. The idea is that customers are also shareholders and each shareholder has the same share in the company. Um, so it's a cooperative union and in insurance we call them mutual insurers. Um, in Germany actually, under German law, you can uh, immediately see this from the legal form. If you ever see uh, an insurance name with the uh, letters A and G at the end, this shows you that this is a mutual insurer. Because as you might know, we have the abbreviation AG with a capital A for Aktiengesellschaft, that is a stock company. But if the A is written uh, in a lowercase letter, it's not a stock company, but it's a mutual company, because this, in this case, it's a so-called VVAG, v -V -A -G, and this is, a, in German, a Versicherungsverein auf Gegenseitigkeit. So it's a mutual insurer. It's a insurance company in the legal form of, um, of a cooperative. Okay, so we have three pillars in the banking system. Savings and loan associations, credit unions, and private universal banks. Um, there are also some specialty banks that have specialized in offering some a select set of uh, services. Some government-owned uh, specialized credit institutions, we'll see them later on. But those three are the large sectors, the three big pillars in the German banking system. In addition to these, we also have the European Central Bank, Deutsche Bundesbank, and the Federal Financial Supervisory Authority, BaFin. 
Now, um, the German system of financial supervision is also a little bit different from uh, other com uh, countries. First of all, uh, one needs to know, we'll later see this, but I can tell you now, um, one needs to know that uh, the supervision of uh, financial companies is more or less uh, the job of the f at the federal level. So this is one area where the states can do a little bit, but usually it's done at the federal level. That's why we have a federal financial supervisory agency, BaFin, Bundesanstalt für Finanzdienstleistungsaufsicht. BaFin was founded by the incorporation of three other agencies, the Fe Federal Financial Supervisory Authority for Banks, the Federal uh, supervisory agency for the insurance sector and the third one for the stock exchange and securities trading. Bundesanstalt für uh, Kreditwesenaufsicht, also BA Kret, uh, und zwei weitere Aufsichtsbehörden. And all these three um, agencies were uh, combined and incorporated into BaFin um, a couple of years ago uh, because one uh, the government realized that uh, financial supervision shouldn't be done by three agencies, but it should be done by one agency because the federal, uh, the financial sector is highly integrated nowadays. Okay. Now, we will see how financial regulation works in Germany. The, the basic idea is, is that at least when it comes to insurance companies and the stock trading and stock exchanges, uh, supervision is done by BaFin. So for insurance companies and the stock exchanges, BaFin is responsible. When it comes to banks, it's a little bit more complicated. Why? First of all, um, nowadays, this changed uh, one or two years ago, nowadays uh, systemically important banks are supervised by the European Central Bank as part of the European Banking Authority and the European Banking Union. Second, banks are supervised by Deutsche Bundesbank when it comes to the uh, operations and at the operative level. Anytime uh, something bad happens at a bank and when it comes to general rules and uh, penalties, BaFin is involved. So BaFin sets the general rules for supervision but it is done by Deutsche Bundesbank. And this is also why Deutsche Bundesbank operates branches across Germany. For example, we have one large branch here in Leipzig, uh, Deutsche Bundesbank, uh, how is it called? I think it's called Hauptverwaltung. And it's uh, the branch for Saxony and I think for Thuringia, for two states of Germany. They sit here in Leipzig and they do the supervision of the local banks and Deutsche Bundesbank, main branch at Frankfurt, also does some uh, supervision and uh, analyses. But e every time something goes bad, goes wrong, if there is a problem, uh, BaFin will additionally step in and BaFin will have the um, authority uh, to hand out penalties. Yeah. And BaFin is, of course, responsible for giving out licenses to operate a bank here in Germany. So supervision is a little bit tricky here. Now, I talked about this again. Even though most banks either concentrate on investment banking or uh, commercial banking, in its nature, the German banking system is a universal banking system. So uh, if a bank has a uh, full bank license, if it is uh, a deposit-taking credit institution, it can offer both services. Huh? Okay. Now, this is uh, uh, an illustration that is uh, more or less taken from the hartmann wendler Pfingsten weber textbook. Um, you can see that the German banking system has in German it's called Kreditbanken. Those are private, um, private banks. We have Sparkassen and also so-called Girozentralen. This is something that dates back to uh, decades and decades ago. Um, the banks in each pillar, uh, the banks are organized and the banks are integrated because they need to operate a payment system uh, 
in which payments from one bank within the same pillar uh, can be transferred to accounts at another bank in the same pillar. And I can still remember this uh, when my parents um, still lived in the 80s and 90s. I can still remember this that back then um, private households used to have two bank accounts, one with a Sparkasse and one with a Volksbank with a credit union. Because if you wanted to transfer money, if you wanted to wire money from one account to another account, there was a cost attached to this uh, transfer. And if you transferred from a Sparkasse to another Sparkasse, it usually was cheaper than transferring money from a Sparkasse to, say, a credit union or to Deutsche Bank or to Commerzbank. So just to be prepared to be able to get money transfers at a lower price from one bank that was in the same pillar, you just had two or three bank accounts in each of the three pillars to um, lower your costs, uh, your transaction costs. Nowadays, with the digitalization, this has become obsolete. You usually only have one bank account. But if you have a look at, um, at an invoice from, say, um, um, a company or from uh, uh, a tradesperson, you, will, you can still see that many businesses still have a couple of bank accounts and they will tend to be one with a Sparkasse, one with a credit union, and maybe one with Commerzbank or Deutsche Bank. Because back then, even 10, 15 years ago, uh, there were higher transaction costs attached to it. Now, to be able to lower transaction costs, all those small, let's stick with the savings and loan associations with these sp uh, Sparkassen, all those Sparkassen, uh, they needed uh, to have an institution at the top level that organizes and nets and does the clearing of all those transactions for each bank. Because you wouldn't want to tell uh, another bank over the telephone, OK, we need to make these and that tr uh, transactions. No, you need a top level institution uh, like a central bank that does the clearing for you. And these used to be the so-called Giro Central. Those were central banks within each pillar that were responsible for clearing all payment transactions within the sector. And this is also how, for example, the infamous and famous Landesbanken came into existence. Landesbanken are institutions that are owned by the federal states and that uh, used to be uh, the banks that organized the clearing for the Sparkassen. And nowadays, uh, for the, you can see this here in the, this part, the Genossenschaftsbanken, though the cooperative banks, the cooperative banks also used to have several pillar-specific central banks. They were the WGZ Bank and the DZ Bank. DZ and WGZ Bank, now they have merged, and it's just the DZ Bank. Uh, located in Frankfurt, it's one, also one of the largest German banks, and it is the head institute for all cooperative banks in Germany. And then, apart from these three pillars, we have real estate, institutions, uh, Bausparkassen, online banks, uh, investment companies, and so on, and also some credit institutions with special purposes. Uh, do you have an idea? Maybe, maybe, maybe you have a faint idea of what this could be, a credit institution with, with special tasks. This is also a very German German thing. There's one famous bank that is a credit institution that has a very special task and uh, is also federally owned. The KFW, the KfW, in German it stands for Kreditanstalt für Wiederaufbau. It's the bank for reconstruction. Uh, 
the KFW was founded as part of the Marshall Plan after the Second World War to finance the reconstruction of Germany after World War II. Of course, that has been accomplished by now, and KFW is now a federally owned bank and one of the largest banks in Germany uh, that gets money from the federal state and finances special programs like, for example, if you wanted to put a solar panel on your uh, roof, you can get subsidies and uh, cheap uh, loans from KFW as a private household. They will also uh, finance, for example, if you want to, um, if you want to decrease uh, the energy input of your house, if you want to use, uh, if you want to have a new roof put atop your house uh, that is more energy efficient, then you can get a cheap loan from KFW. So this is a bank that is not out for profits, but that is tasked with uh, financing and supporting special projects at the federal level, and that's KFW. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also they had to step in, uh, in some cases during the financial crisis, uh, to bail out other banks because this is the, the banking uh, arm of the federal government here. Yeah. Um, going back, you mentioned the Eiro Zentralen. Yeah, um, Giro Zentralen. Zentralen. Yeah. Uh, their role was sort of to be the central bank of each pillar. Um, for the Sparkassen, especially for the Sparkassen pillar, okay. yeah. So if do we in Germany still have that system today where there's this division between yeah. the Yeah. So yeah. What that's there still, yeah. Today? It's still the same. Okay. The, the Giro Central, those are more or less the, uh, the Landesbank nowadays. Okay. Yeah? And um, we have, we'll, we'll talk about the Sparkassen sector later on. Uh, the Sparkassen sector is quite peculiar, I have to say. They also have, um, they have large companies. Uh, that are responsible, for example, for IT and uh, risk management tools. Uh, these uh, companies are owned by all the Sparkassen and they offer services to all the Sparkassen within the pillar. And actually there is also one lobby group at the head that is it's a lobbying group, more or less. It's uh, the head organization that is the DSGV, the Deutsche Sparkassen und Giro Verband. This is the uh, head organization of all Sparkassen, of all savings and loan associations. And this is where all the major decisions for all Sparkassen are made. And um, they make the rules, uh, they make uh, joint policies, and the Giro Central they, and some other companies, they are responsible for clearing, risk management, uh, IT, so that if you step into a Sparkasse, anywhere in Germany. It will look the same, although those are uh, quite distinct companies. Yeah? So for example, Sparkasse Leipzig is owned by the Stadt Leipzig, by the city of Leipzig. Uh, but the branches and uh, the products, they will look the same, 95, 99%, as the products and the branches, say Sparkasse Dortmund, Sparkasse Frankfurt, Frankfurter Sparkasse, it's called. No? So this is one of their unique selling propositions. They are quite small, and each bank usually is quite small. I mean, the Sparkasse Leipzig is, is an exception because Leipzig is so large, but you sometimes have Sparkassen uh, in a city with just 60,000 inhabitants. So it's a, it's a very small regional local bank. But they profit from the synergy effects they get from all those head institutions. Same marketing, same products. Uh, they can sell insurance contracts that are offered by the head insurance, um, the, the, uh, the top level insurance companies. Um, and this is how they are able to compete. You know? Um, otherwise, they and, and nowadays we can see that because all those Sparkassen, all those small banks do have problems because of digitalization, because of direct banking and so on, and the low interest rates, they are getting problems and they have to merge. For example, in my hometown, we had a Sparkasse uh, for Carmen 
50,000 uh, inhabitants, and UNA also had a Sparkasse, and Fröndenberg. Fröndenberg had like 20,000 population, uh, UNA had 60,000. Uh, now they all had to merge, but they do not merge with banks from other pillars. They just form Sparkasse UNA, Sparkasse Kam, now it's Sparkasse UNA Kam. Yeah? yeah, and they merge and they try, uh, usually it's just uh, uh, closing branches and cutting down personnel, especially in the management, you know, because they have two boards and they can save on one board. Yeah. yeah, but we'll see more of this later on. And here's supervision. European Central Bank, Deutsche Bundesbank, BaFin. And in some cases, for example, in uh, the state of Hess, uh, with Frankfurt and the German stock exchange located, the most important uh, stock exchange located in Frankfurt. Some local state level authorities are also responsible for the supervision of the Frankfurt stock exchange. But, uh, securities trading uh, is supervised at the federal level. One never sees this uh, often. Um, they do analyses and they try to prevent um, um, fraud and um, uh, fraudulent trading and insider trading. There are some quite famous examples where BaFin ha has actually stepped in. Uh, one example are CFDs. Uh, since a couple of years, BaFin has been authorized by, uh, uh, under law to uh, um, prohibit uh, certain trades and certain contracts and certain instruments. It used to be that BaFin did not have the authority uh, to prevent any type of financial instrument and ban any instrument. Nowadays, they have this authority under law. And they have used this only once, I think, uh, for um, CFDs. Because those are trades, uh, you might have seen this, for example, if I go to YouTube, um, this is everything I get because I have, uh, I searched for finance related videos and nowadays I only get uh, uh, ads for uh, trading with CFDs. Yeah? No risk and make a fortune in a day. And CFDs also, um, in some cases, CFD contracts have an unlimited loss probability and loss, unlimited loss potential. And this is something that was marketed to private households in Germany and BaFin stepped in and banned the most dangerous types of CFD contracts in Germany. This is one uh, occasion in which BaFin made the newspapers. Does anyone know a second example where they famously made the newspapers? Something I'm quite... Uh, uh, I can relate to um, because I'm from Dortmund. Any idea? You might have heard that um, Dortmund has, at the moment, a quite successful uh, football team, uh, Borussia Dortmund. And two years ago, Borussia Dortmund, the team was attacked uh, uh, from uh, a bomb maker who hit a bomb right uh, next to the street. Uh, the team bus went uh, to their Champions League game. The bomb exploded, only one, luckily only one player was injured. And Bafin, no one knew what happened there. And Bafin, uh, as part of their market overwatch, realized that some person had uh, uh, strangely ordered a lot uh, of uh, short positions on the stock of Borussia Dortmund. They identified this person because this was highly unusual and uh, uh, gave the information to the police and this was the assailant. This was the person who actually was so stupid enough uh, to rent a room in the hotel so that he could over uh, see uh, the bus leaving the hotel and this was the person who attacked the bus. He had a, a huge short position on the sh uh, stock of Borussia Dortmund and he wanted the stock to go down and make a fortune. And BaFin, as part of their regular market uh, um, control, realized this and saw a spike in short positions. Mm -hmm. So this is what they do. But in, with banking, uh, Deutsche Bundesbank does the supervision. Okay. Yeah. 
So this is the supervision. Now let's start with the first pillar, private banks. One has to be careful. I had a hard time translating this word uh, from German to uh, English. Why? Um, because we have to make a fine distinction. Um, in German, we usually say private Geschäftsbanken. Why? That means private commercial banks. First of all, we have to realize it's not just commercial banks. And the, the definitive and the defining um, detail here is that they are privately owned. Those are usually stock companies. But in German, the word Privatbank has a slightly different meaning. Does anyone know what a Privatbank is? Which would be the direct translation of private bank. It wouldn't be a privately owned bank. It would be a bank that offers private banking. And this is something different. Any idea what that could be? Privatbank? A synonym is bankhaus. Banking house. In English, I don't think that the, this word exists, but in German we have bankhaus. Yeah? Literally, it translates into bank house. A private bank or privat bank, uh, a bank that offers private banking services, is, for example, a bank that is located, located uh, and headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland. And every time um, you want, uh, you have more than, say, 1 million euros in assets, and you want your private banker to take hold of your account to offer you specialized services for wealthy customers, that is private banking, also wealth management. And if you have ever been to Switzerland and have stepped out of a plane, you will see a lot of ads for private, uh, private banking houses uh, that are headquartered in Switzerland. Yeah? Asset management, wealth management, and private banking, but you need to have at least, say, 1 million euros in assets to become a customer. So usually they will not accept you as a customer. No? So this is what we call Privatbank in Germany. Uh, so this pillar comprises all banks that are privately owned, private Geschäftsbank. So one aspect is they are privately owned. Usually they uh, tend to try uh, profit maximization and they trade under the legal form of a stock company or a KGAA. This is a German uh, legal form that is, I think, quite difficult to uh, explain or even to translate. Kommanditgesellschaft of Aktien. Eine Kommanditgesellschaft, a KG, is a private company, actually. It's a, uh, it's a private company where you have two types of shareholders. Shareholders who have a, a fixed share in the company and who have also limited liability. And you need to have at least one shareholder that has unlimited liability. So in a private company, usually you have the owners and they are also liable with their private wealth. If the company goes bankrupt, the sh uh, well, not shareholders, but the owners have to step in and they are, their own private uh, assets are also liable. The difference to a stock company is that liability is limited to the shares. And a KGAA, eine Kommanditgesellschaft auf Aktien, is something right in between. You have two types of shareholders, two types of owners. You have shareholders with a uh, limited liability and at least one owner with unlimited liability. So it depends on if you are uh, um, complementaire. Uh, the person who is a complementaire has unlimited liability and a commanditist is a shareholder that has limited liability. And if the shares in this company are, have been given out in shares, in stocks, it's a KGAA, Kommanditgesellschaft of Aktien. But usually you will have a stock company. And there is good reason why banks are only allowed to operate under the legal, as a legal entity, as a, a stock company. Why? Because the financial supervisory agency is of the opinion that 
um, you cannot have a company with unlimited liability um, to operate banking business. So if there is one, per, if you have shareholders and one shareholder has, one owner has unlimited liability, it means that there is some, um, there is some risk that you could think that, ah, I still have this owner of the company and he is liable with his own private wealth and his own private assets. But in many cases, one realizes, okay, the assets are worthless or the person doesn't have unlimited liability. So the financial supervisory agency wants to make sure that if you uh, enter a contract with a bank, you know that this is a stock company and that liability is limited to the shares of this company. Okay. And most of them have started in securities business and investment banking, but they are also in private uh, retail banking. Well, private banks, Privatbank. We have Deutsche Bank, Commerzbank. You might know that uh, for a couple of months now, they have been assumably in talks to merge because both are not doing well. Hypo Vereinsbank. Hypo Vereinsbank is usually abbreviated HVB. HVB. Um, it is a German bank, Hypo Vereinsbank, but it is owned by Unicredit. If you don't know Unicredit yet, uh, you might have an idea if I tell you its former name, Unicredito. It's one of the largest, if not the largest, Italian banking group. And at some point, Unicredit entered the German market and they bought Hypo Vereinsbank. They still operate under the name uh, Hypo Vereinsbank, although uh, they have, over the last decade, I guess, they have tried a slight rebranding, starting from Hypo Vereinsbank Hypo Vereinsbank, a member of the Unicredito group, to Hypo Vereinsbank slash Unicredit. And I think at some point they will just rebrand it to Unicredit, but it's Unicredit. And Postbank. But one has to see that Postbank used to be uh, a national company, a state owned, uh, the banking branch of the German. Uh, federal post, uh, um, uh, post service. Postbank um, is owned by Deutsche Bank. It's a subsidiary of Deutsche Bank. They bought it at some point. And it's quite funny to see that uh, every couple of years Deutsche Bank says, we want to sell it, we want to keep it, we want to sell it, we want to keep it. They haven't made up their mind whether they want to keep Deutsche Bank or not. Right now it seems they want to keep it. Then there are some regionally operating German branch banks, Filialbanken, for example, Nationalbank, uh, Südwestbank, uh, and here one has to be careful. Nationalbank is a privately owned bank that has nothing to do with a national bank in the US. Later on, we'll see that in the US, every time you have the word national in your name, it means that you are federally chartered. And then by showing, this is, a, this is a, an indication uh, that you, you are not allowed to use the word national in your name, in your firm title, unless you are federally chartered with the, I think, FED or FDIC. Later. We'll see this later on. But it, it, it makes a difference. If you are a state bank or a national bank, you know, here with Nationalbank, it doesn't matter. It's just a name they've given themselves. Hmm? Then we have internet banks, ING Deba. Uh, does anyone know uh, what ING Deba is? ING Deba. It's not a German bank, but it is. Anyone? It's owned by. the ING group. And if you carefully watch the spelling of group, you will realize that it's a Dutch company. It's a Dutch uh, company uh, that has, uh, is large in the Netherlands. Uh, and they entered the German banking sector and the German banking market by uh, opening an internet bank. And this is ING DIBA. DIBA stands for Direct Bank. 
that is a synonym for online bank or internet bank. Uh, Comdirect, uh, Com already hints at that this is owned by Commerzbank and DKB, Deutsche Kreditbank, I think it is owned by a Bavarian bank, so it's, it's a subsidiary of another bank and uh, DKB only is offering online banking services. And then we have private bankers or banking houses in German, Bankhaus, Bankhäuser. Those are the only ones that are allowed to trade under the legal form of a general partnership or a limited partnership. The Kommanditgesellschaft is close to a limited partnership and uh, the ORD, the Offene Handelsgesellschaft, is close to what is a general partnership in the UK legal system. And therefore, they have at least one personally liable shareholder. And the German Banking Act, uh, paragraph 32, states that the owners of a banking house or a bank house need a written permission from BaFin for offering banking services. This is a special situation. Nowadays, no new bank can be incorporated as a general or a limited partnership. BaFin has suspended this, um, or not BaFin, but uh, the German Banking Act. But because most private banks date back to the 14th, 15th, 16th century, Rothschild, Saal Oppenheim, those are the famous banking houses that used to finance dukes and kings in Germany. Um, these are still allowed to operate under these legal forms, but if they ever go bankrupt, if they cease to exist, no new bank uh, in the legal form under, under the legal form of a general or limited partnership is allowed to be incorporated. Some examples, some famous examples, Berenberg Bank, Bankhaus Lampe, Saal Oppenheim, uh, Rothschild, etc. Uh, one example here is quite interesting. You know who is the rest, of course, you are allowed to own a bank. Do you know uh, to which company Bankhaus and Lampe belongs to? You will probably have eaten a pizza from them. It's Dr. Oetker. Uh, the, does anyone know Dr. Oetker? I mean, all the exchange students? Dr. Oetker is, is a huge producer of um, um, pizza uh, uh, and uh, frozen pizza and other frozen things. And uh, Dr. Oetker is owned by a family and the family also owns Bankhaus Lampe. So it's the bank of the Oetker family. You know? And often those private banks only offer services in the field of private banking, wealth management and also investment banking. And you need to be a wealthy client to be able to become a customer at one of those private banking houses. We also have some foreign book, uh, banks. For example, uh, Banco Santander. Is anyone from a Spanish-speaking country? No? No? Yeah? I'm from Sierra and we have also Banco Santander. Yeah, OK. And it's Santander, right? Yeah. I, I stress this because in German, it's known as Santander Bank. Uh, For some reason, German people are not able to pronounce the Spanish word Santander, right? So in, in Spain, it's, I think, the largest bank, uh, at least one of the top three banks, Banco Santander, highly successful, highly profitable. And they opened um, um, an affiliate here in Germany, uh, the Santander Bank, but most people just call it Santander, uh, Santander. Targo Bank uh, used to be Citibank. Uh, also quite interesting. In the US, it's Citigroup. Uh, in Germany, it used to be Citibank, and Citibank, in 2008, the German affiliate, the German subsidiary, was sold to Credit Mutuel, a French uh, banking uh, group, uh, but they, well, Germans are not able to pronounce Credit Mutuel, so what they did is they uh, made up this name Targo Bank. Santander Bank and Targo Bank are quite famous because they only engage in retail banking and they try uh, quite aggressively to compete in the retail banking sector. Retail banking sector meaning 
a lot of loans with small amounts. 100 euro here, 2,000 euros there. Usually not mortgage loans, just retail banking loans, uh, retail loans. And have you seen them? Have you been in contact with them? Actually, I opened uh, an account with Targo Bank uh, almost 17 years ago when it was still uh, Citibank for one simple reason. Uh, when I went to Japan for my exchange semester, I needed, uh, I, I thought about opening a bank account in Japan or I needed a bank that was able uh, to offer me banking services in Japan as well. Uh, and the Sparkassen told me, yes, of course, you can, you can withdraw money from any ATM. It will cost you 20 euros per transaction. I thought, well, no. Okay. So I looked for a bank that also operated uh, branches in Japan. And at that time, only Deutsche Bank had one branch in Tokyo. And Citibank operated branches all across Japan. So I opened a Citibank account here and withdrew money from the ATM machines in Japan at Citibanks. So that was quite convenient. When they changed to Credit Mutual, I closed my account. And Targo Bank and Santander Bank are now, I think, the main partners of uh, retail shops that offer 0% uh, loans for, for example, buying a new TV. So if you go to MediaMarkt or Saturn, the two uh, largest uh, tech shops here in Germany, uh, you might, well, you will might see this that they offer zero percent financing, and the banking partners are usually Santander and Targo Bank because they try to attract new customers with this zero percent loan, and then they have your address, and they will never stop sending you ads and letters. You know? It's, it's a lot, I can tell you. Some other banks, for example, ABN AMRO. ABN AMRO is a large Dutch bank, but they only offer uh, banking services to their own Dutch uh, business customers here. So you cannot really become a customer if you are from Germany, but they have some branches uh, to which you can go to if you are a customer in the Netherlands. And some private mortgage banks, Hypo Real Estate, I told you about that last week, BHW Bausparkasse, those are private building societies. And that's, those are some, some, some minor examples. Okay. In the first pillar, uh, you have a large lobby group that is the Bundesverband Deutscher Banken, the Federal Association of German Banks. Uh, this lobby group is the main. Imp most important task is lobby work and organizing deposit insurance for this pillar of private banking corporations. They have a compensation fund of German banks, the Entschädigungseinrichtung Deutscher Banken GmbH, the deposit protection fund of the Association of German Banks, Einlagensicherungsfonds des Bundesverbandes Deutscher Banken. And those are their main tasks, lobbying and deposit insurance. At the end of 2010, we had approximately 20, 218 private banks, now it's even less. Uh, four major banks, 160 regional banks. Uh, in 2006, there were still 360 institutions, so the number of banks is going down and down and down. Banks are merging, Ma banks are, some banks are even closing down, and it's decreasing. Okay. To give you an idea, I will not go into too much detail here. Uh, to give you an idea of what a private bank in Germany looks like, I think it's quite instructive to look at the balance sheet. And this is an extract from the uh, balance sheet, uh, the annual report of Deutsche Bank as the largest private banking corporation in Germany. And what you can see from this is it's large. It has a, a total assets of almost uh, this is the state income, let me just see. Those are the assets, yeah. Uh, it had a total assets of 1.7 billion euros. No, ah, mistake, trillion. Billion in German, trillion in English. Uh, 1.7 trillion euros in 2014. Um, and you can see from the income statement here that you have interest income and interest expense and also commissions and fee income. Several things, several points. First of all, 
banks have huge balance sheets. Why? Banks engage in getting money in and capital in and giving out loans. So banks are in the business of taking and giving money. So the balance sheet will be blown up. And in this case of Deutsche Bank, you can see the total assets is at 1.7 trillion euros. So it doesn't make sense to compare the balance sheet of a bank to one from an industrial company. For example, Daimler, as a huge uh, automotive corporation, will probably only have maybe 50, 100 billion euros assets uh, on its balance sheet. So you cannot compare balance sheets from a financial to a non-financial corporation, first thing. Second, if you want to make a very broad distinction between the commercial banking and the lending business and investment banking of a bank, just look at this and this here, interest versus non-interest income and expenses. Interest, everything that is interest related comes from lending and deposit taking. Everything that is not interest related, non-interest income, non-interest expenses is investment banking. Fees commissions, everything you earn from offering services that are not really related to a loan or to a deposit. That is why some researchers, for example, Markus Brunnermeyer from uh, Princeton, he has a paper out, oh, I think it's almost five or six years old. He looks at the degree to which banks engage in risky investment banking. And what he does is just he takes interest income divided by non-interest income. And this is a proxy for the degree to which a bank does in investment banking. A quite simple proxy, but nevertheless, it shows you that by looking at the income statement and by the uh, proportion of income to non-interest income, you can, you can at least get a first idea of how much the bank is invested in investment banking. OK. And just have a look at this um, balance sheet. The second pillar consists of the public sector or the government, the state-owned banks. And those are usually held completely or mainly by the state, uh, by the government, that is counties and cities. Normally, uh, the federation is a bad translation, the Bund, yeah? the federal state. So uh, the, let's, let's call it the federal government. Yeah? Uh, it's, it's what we call in German the Bund is more than just the federal government, but it's the whole entity of all federal organizations at the federal level. And then we have the federal states like Saxony, uh, Berlin, Hamburg, North Rhine-Westphalia, Bavaria, and so on. A municipality, a community, a city, a county, also an administrative union or another public agency. They own their existence due to specific public interests, for example, to supply the population with credit and loans. They all often but always have the legal form of a public agency institution that is also quite difficult to translate it. Anstalt des öffentlichen Rechts. It's an organization under public law. That's how we call it in German. So they are a Anstalt des öffentlichen Rechts. And what is quite uh, a defining property is that they only operate regionally. They restrict their business to this region. And they only offer specific banking products. For example, you need to have a good reason why you could become a customer at Sparkasse Leipzig, usually because you're a citizen of the city of Leipzig. They will perhaps also accept you if you live somewhere else, but if you only work here at Leipzig. But if you live and work somewhere else, you need to have a good reason why they should accept you. And even if you are a good customer, they will not do it. Why? Because they have this agreement in this pillar that they do not compete with each other in different areas. Hmm? A hot topic with the European Union, quite naturally. So, who, which institutions belong to the public sector? 
Deutsche Bundesbank, one needs to remind oneself that Deutsche Bundesbank as Germany's central bank or part of the central bank, I mean the European Central Bank is also Germany's central bank, but Deutsche, bank, Deutsche Bundesbank as uh, Germany's central bank is of course state-owned. The profits and also the losses are given to uh, the Bund, the federal government. Um, the Bundesbank also has some quite peculiar tasks. For example, the Deutsche Bundesbank is the guardian of Germany's gold bullion. And they only recently transferred the gold bullion, gold reserves, from New York back to Frankfurt. Deutsche Bundesbank, uh, it's also quite interesting. You, one needs to remind oneself that this is a bank. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, working together with colleagues from Deutsche Bundesbank and two things they were particularly proud of. First of all, they have an account with Deutsche Bundesbank. They have a bank account. They don't need to open a bank account as another bank. They have their own bank. And they have uh, a bank account card with the federal eagle on it. So every time they pay, they show off with paying with their Bundesbank banking cards. And every time the European Central Bank prints new money, it's first of all delivered to the ATM in the cantina, for example, at Deutsche Bundesbank. So they were able to withdraw, uh, they were able to withdraw money from the Bundesbank ATM, freshly minted uh, notes. Yeah? The ones that were not yet in circulation. So it's a bank, it's a bank. And also I think uh, the university has an account with the Deutsche Bundesbank. So it's all the federal uh, and the government institutions have an account with Deutsche Bundesbank. So if you need to pay your student's fees, you will pay to the uh, university's account with Deutsche Bundesbank. Then we have DK Bank, Deutsche Giro Centrale. This is one of the last uh, institutions that have survived here. They used to be responsible for clearing accounts and transactions. Nowadays, uh, do you know what Deka Bank does? Any idea? It's the investment bank and asset manager for all Sparkassen. One could imagine that it doesn't be, it is not very efficient for a Sparkasse to uh, have its own investment bank and asset management division. So even the small Sparkasse, they can sell and offer services in investment banking and asset management, but they are only acting on behalf of Deka Bank. They are selling products from Deka Bank. So this is the top level investment and asset manager for the Sparkassen. Then we have Landesbanken. Those are state-owned regional banks, and they used to be responsible for supporting local economic growth, for giving out business loans and this sort of thing. Uh, some of them, uh, before the financial crisis, uh, and in their quest for yield, they tried other things and they went bankrupt. Saxony had its own experience with this. Uh, the uh, Sachsen LB, LB, LB stands for Landesbank. Uh, Sachsen LB famously uh, crashed during the financial crisis. They were bailed out by the uh, Landesbank of uh, Baden-Württemberg. This is why uh, it's now part of LBBW, Landesbank Baden-Württemberg. And they are located in, the, in this direction. Uh, right next to the Sparkasse, you can see a small uh, skyscraper, a small building that has uh, LBBV, Sachsen LB, uh, on its side. I think they might have changed this now, uh, only a couple of months ago. But this used to be a Landesbank. Uh, North Rhine-Westphalia, my home state, also had its own experience with this uh, West LB, famously uh, bankrupted uh, during the financial crisis and it has now been permanently closed. Uh, there are some banks, Landesbank, that are still uh, uh, operating, Helaba, Nord LB and some others. And we have savings banks, the Sparkassen. There used to be 417, now the, the number is decreasing by the day. And Freie Sparkassen, free or independent savings banks. Does anyone have an idea what is so special about a free 
Sparkasse, freie Sparkasse. For example, Haspa, the Hamburger Sparkasse, is one famous example of a free Sparkasse, a free savings bank. <coughs> It is not owned by the city of Hamburg, but it's owned, it is more or less its own owner. You know, it's a very strange legal construction. It's free in the sense that uh, the Hamburger Sparkasse is not owned by the city of Hamburg, but it is owned by a foundation of itself. You know, it's, it's more or less, it owns itself. This is why it's a free Sparkasse. And, They are, they are proud of that. Okay. Then some Grundkreditanstalten, banks with special tasks, bank with special tasks with part concession, uh, KFW Banking Group, Landesbausparkassen, those are state-owned regional building societies, but this is, uh, I think, the, the most important uh, public sector banks are Sparkassen. Sparkassen. Now, in 2006, savings banks had almost 15,000 branches. And you can imagine that if not the number of uh, Sparkassen goes down by the day, the number of branches is increasing by the hour. Because uh, 15,000 branches is just uh, a result of the fact that uh, a couple of years ago, back until a couple of years ago, Sparkassen were Uh, not forced to compete in a free market. Uh, they have um, special protection because they are owned by the state, meaning they have no risk of default. And even worse, it was more or less a cartel. Uh, they, had, they had institutions, they shared similar products, they shared similar marketing, uh, they didn't compete with other Sparkassen in other regions. Uh, so a highly uh, oligopolistic market and uh, because uh, they were owned by the cities with politicians on the board, uh, the politicians and the stakeholders were interested in a lot of branches, a lot of jobs created, uh, which meant that many Sparkassen operated too many branches, had too many personnel, uh, and nowadays with interest rates going down and some of the protection being gone, they need to uh, decrease the number of branches, they need to digitalize, and they need uh, to reduce uh, manpower and cut some jobs. So this, is, this was the situation before the financial crisis. Nowadays, they're cutting down on branches and personnel. Two things were special about Sparkassen. <coughs> First of all, the institutional liability and the guarantor liability. In German, Anstaltslast und Gewährträgerhaftung, which were in place until 2005. More or less, both mean that a Sparkasse was impossible to go bankrupt. Why? Because if a Sparkasse was bankrupt, was closing in on insolvency, on default, the state had to step in, or the city, or the county. And because by definition, a city, or a county, or the government cannot go bankrupt, at least in Germany, one would think so, um, those had no risk of default. And they could have give out, they could have give out loans, They had no real financing uh, costs. And this was a huge advantage to Sparkassen, especially at the European level. So the European Union, the, um, um, the EU Commission, stepped in and said to Germany that if the banking system, w uh, if we wanted to integrate the European banking sector, Uh, first of all, we would need to allow foreign banks to enter the German banking system. And second, we would need to um, cut down on the competitive advantages the government was giving out to German state-owned banks, Sparkassen. This is what they did. So the, both, both more or less are related to the liability of a bank in case it defaults. First of all, it means The institutional liability means that this is a principle that includes securing the economic basis of the institution for the entire duration of its existence by the 
owning body, for example, the city or the county, and the guarantor liability is the direct claim of creditors to this body, to the city. There is a fine distinction between the two. The first one means that just in case of bankruptcy, you can go to the city or the state. The second means that you don't even need the bank to be bankrupt or closing in on default. You can just go to the city and ask for repayment. So this, the first one only comes into play when the Sparkasse has actually filed for bankruptcy. And the second one means that don't care, don't bother, just go to the city if it's bankrupt or not. That is, the state is equal to the Sparkasse. There's no real distinction, legal distinction between the two. Both have been uh, abolished due to pressure coming from the European Union. And nowadays, uh, Sparkassen can go bankrupt. Uh, the state uh, is not allowed to give out blank guarantees to Sparkassen. They will never go bankrupt. Why? Because the state and especially the association of all savings and loan associations, the DSGV, has mechanisms in place, uh, in play, yeah, in place, that other Sparkasse, they will step in and bail out bankrupt Sparkassen to guarantee the stability of the whole pillar. But these two things, they have been abolished. Okay. Yeah, both have been abolished due to initiative from the EU Commission. And then we have one example here. This is the balance sheet of Haspa, the Hamburger Sparkasse. Coincidentally, also one of the largest banks in Germany. Why? Because Hamburg is a large and wealthy city. And here you can see they have, it's quite small actually. Um, it's much smaller than for Deutsche Bank, but for uh, an average German bank, it's quite large. And the interesting thing here is that you can see it's much more of a commercial bank than it's an investment bank. It has a huge amount of deposits and a huge amount of loans on its balance sheet. And here you can see this is quite, um, this is quite peculiar to a Sparkasse. Okay, same here, this is equity. And here you have deposits. Yeah. So deposit taking and lending are the main focus of uh, a Sparkasse. Now, last but not least, we have the third pillar, cooperative banks. The common feature to this group is that by establishing themselves, they have committed to the promotion of the acquisition and business of its members. This is stated in paragraph uh, one of the German Cooperative Act, Genossenschaftsgesetz. Uh, just to be sure, um, Genossenschaften are an example of more or less a very socialistic idea of a business. Each customer becomes a shareholder and each shareholder is only allowed to have the same share in the company as everyone else. Meaning that we could form a cooperative and every one of you could hand in 100 euros and then we could start a cooperative. If one of you wanted to buy more shares in the company, the cooperative would cease to exist and it would, have, it would need to be transformed into a stock company. So the only real difference is that is we, we do not want profits. We want this product to be offered. We want to uh, satisfied um, a demand. And this is why you can see cooperatives, especially in agriculture, uh, in banking, and in insurance. And here um, we have cooperative banks, and characteristics of these banks are that the liable equity capital consists of the credit balances of all members, slash shareholders, slash customers. Uh, they usually only do regional business, they primarily grant loans, similar to savings banks, and they are organized as a registered cooperative company. In German, it's an E dot G dot, and it stands for Eingetragene Registered Genossenschaft, cooperative. 
So every time you see Bank Leipzig EG, you know that this is a cooperative. Now with the Volksbank, the word Volksbank is protected under law. You cannot open a bank and call yourself Volksbank, people's bank, if you are not a cooperative. However, there are some famous examples of cooperative banks that are not Volks- or Raiffeisenbank. Any ideas? Quite large ones. Apobank. It's one bank that is not known by many people, but it's actually the largest cooperative bank in Germany. It's larger than any other cooperative, than any other Volksbank. It's the Ärzte und Apotheker Bank, so the Physicians and Pharmacists Bank, and it's a cooperative. And they, do you, do you have an idea why they formed this cooperative? Because at some point, if you become a doctor, if you become a pharmacist, you need to open shop. Um, and especially in some areas of medicine, you need a lot of capital. For example, if you start at, as a radiologist, you need to buy uh, radiology equipment for a couple of million euros. And if you just come out of medical school, you don't have any capital. So you need to go to a bank to finance the equipment for your radiology office. And at some point, uh, physicists realized, or physicians re realized, that banks were not willing to grant loans because they didn't understand the business. So they formed their own cooperative, and this has evolved into the largest cooperative bank in Germany, the Apobank. If you come out of the uh, Leipzig Central Station, there is a net on one of the buildings right across the Central Station, Apobank. Another famous example is Paxbank. It's the bank of the Catholic bishops and bishop areas. Bistuma. Pax S and Peace. Pax Bank, Apple Bank, some church owned banks are cooperatives. The structure is quite similar to the Sparkassen. They are regionally organized. Uh, they have one central institution nowadays. It's the DZ Bank in Frankfurt. The DZ Bank offers uh, joint policies, methods, clearing for all those cooperative banks. Uh, we, have, we had approximately 1,000 folks in Halbeisenbanken, approximately 10 Sparda Banken, those are for Spar and Darlehens, so savings and loan banks. Um, five PSD banks, those are purely retail banks. Uh, and they also have um, federal or huge banks at the federal level um, that offer investment bank services, asset management, and insurance products to all those cooperatives. And those are R&B insurance and union investment. Union investment and R&V Versicherung, those are the two that offer all the insurance products and asset management uh, instruments to the cooperative banks. So again, you as a Volksbank might be quite small, but you can use the products and you can sell products and services from the head institutions in your pillar um, and you can also use the same marketing you can use um, the same symbol and this is why most volksbanken they look alike in germany it's not one bank but it's uh, one of many banks that simply uses uh, all the services and advertising from the from the pillar Okay, now these are the la 10 biggest banking companies in 2012, Deutsche Bank, Commerzbank, you can see that KFW, state owned, is uh, the third largest bank, or used to be the third largest bank, DZ Bank, Unicredit, LBBW, uh, Norddeutsche Landesbank, Landesbank Hessen Thüringen, Postbank, uh, again, remember, Though the Sparkassen and the cooperative banks, because they operate only regionally, they are quite small. And we have many local banks. The largest banks are the Landesbanken and the private banks. Okay. Number of banks, here you can see 
Kreditbanken, Sparkassen, ja, that is quite different. And here you can see the structure of the German Universal Banks in a balance sheet. Uh, actually, most Sparkassen and most cooperative banks only do lending and deposit taking, uh, and it is Commerzbank and Deutsche Bank who offer investment banking services, especially at a European or uh, international level. Okay, and some additional statistics on the German banking system. Do you have any questions concerning the three pillars? When it comes to supervision, we'll talk about this later on here in chapter seven on bank regulation. But I hope you have now have an understanding of the of the special system in Germany, and uh, especially the Sparkassen. They are quite special here in Germany because they are state owned and they are owned by the cities and uh, counties. And in some cases, one has to see that in some regions, you only will only have a Sparkassen. Uh, you will not have branches of private banks or Volksbanken because there simply are none. No? And then this is the only bank that operates in this region. But uh, we have three pillars. And it should be that it's a completely integrated, free, competitive market. So if a Sparkasse cannot offer good services, it could be forced out of business. But this is very, very rare. Okay. So if you have no further questions, thank you for your attention and see you next time. Thank you.